thank you guys for coming. I'm really excited about this. Um, I, I, what I wanted to give you guys right there on page one is kind of the, the outline. Who, does everyone, everyone has an outline? Okay. Um, so really how that boils down is, is the first four classes are going to be like the, the, the how, how do you do this, the why, the what, the how. And then, and then um, lessons or classes five through 12 are really fun examples of what we're talking about. And this is designed to be like class participation, especially in a, in a size like this. We can um, you know, just have fun with this. Um, we'll have Q&A at the end as well. But all throughout the class, please you know, raise your hand or just blot out, you know, just blurt out <clears throat> if you have questions or whatever. Really honestly ask questions. If you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me, but I don't want to look like an idiot. Like a everyone's thinking, everyone's asking that question. So just ask, and that will that'll be great. Uh, let's leave them open. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, we'll we'll look at getting the AC on next next week. <clears throat> um, and so please definitely engage, um, ask questions, so on. And I'm going to be conscientious of the time. Make sure that we're good there. Um, yeah, and then I also want to let you guys know, I don't know if you guys have have received invitation for this or not, but if not, you will after this class for sure. Do you guys have access to the, the Pathright um, a website uh, where where you can cop on and some of, okay, you don't even have to answer because you're already answering. It's cool. I can, yeah, I can see the... <laughs> Yeah, it's for the for Grace Church. For some of you are like totally, and some of you are like, what the heck? <clears throat> so, basically, here's what it is: just a website through Grace Church. It's not on the Grace Church website. That's why it's 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 through a um, 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 a software called Pathright. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this is being videotaped. Um, all the classes will be videotaped. So if you have to miss one. Um, no worries there. We're, we're going to give everyone access to this as part of the registration. Is there's going to be um, there's going to be more resources, uh, more to dive deeper on things that we need to cover in the class. Um, there's also going to be kind of a, a, the ability to have um, community in this class on there, so you can type in like not just questions. You can type in, uh, hey, I was reading my Bible today. I saw this, you know, and, and everyone gets to be encouraged and whatnot. And so, so we're going to make sure that everyone has access to that. So, um, you know, it's not required, but it's just something, an additional resource for everyone. Um, so with that, let me, uh, let me lead us in prayer and we'll, we'll just dive in. <clears throat> Father, we are grateful that we're even at church today, that we're saved, that you saved each one of us. We are grateful. Father, I admit that sometimes I just forget how amazing it is to be saved. Um, and, and so, Father, I pray that this class that one of the fruits of this class, I pray that you would bring about the fruit that I believe you so desire to bring about is that everyone in this class, including me, desperately need me, um, would just walk away being more amazed, more astonished at who you are, at what you've done in Jesus Christ for us. Help us to have a, a greater hunger for your word because we're, we're, uh, we're, we're amazed at, at what we're beholding in your word, namely Jesus Christ. So make these things real in our hearts today and, and in the classes to come. Pray your blessing on us. Father, give me the vocabulary and, 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 and guard me from speaking uh, air, but only, only let me speak what you want to be spoken. We all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So as you saw on, your, on the top there, uh, the first page, so today, what is biblical theology and why is it important? So the what and why, okay? Um, let me just tell you right off the bat that what it's not, <laughs> we're not, when we say biblical theology, we don't mean, um, hey, Latanya, we don't mean um, theology that is biblical, that's not, that would be a, um, what you might think, like, well, 
biblical theology. It's Biblical theology, but, but that that's not so. So it's it's actually a technical term. What we don't mean here is I'm going to now give you guys theology that is is biblical. It's not heresy. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a more of a technical term that has to do with a, a, a system of thought of how to interpret, how to interpret scripture, how to how to think through scripture. Um, so I, I, I gave a couple quotes here um, on bullets one and two here. What is biblical theology? So the first one, um, Jeff, can you read the first quote? Biblical theology is an approach to reading the whole story of the Bible while keeping our focus on the main point of Scripture, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, so biblical theology is an approach to reading the whole story of the Bible. So you got the whole in mind, but you have Jesus Christ as the main point of the whole. Okay, um, and uh, okay, I'm gonna. This is cute, trying to be humble. Okay, remind me your name again, Terry. Terry, right? Okay, Terry, can you read the second bullet point? Biblical theology is the discipline of learning how to read the Bible as one story by one divine author that culminates in the person and the work of Christ, so that every part of Scripture is understood in relation to Christ. Perfect. Thank you. So I just like giving different different definitions, right? You say it one way, you say it another way. Maybe it clicks the second time around, whatnot. So my summary on this was really just following the Bible storyline of God's redemptive plan through Jesus Christ. Um, there, I did put down here that there's movement, and what I mean by that is you're you're looking at a text, and we'll get into this as the class gets goes on. But you're looking at a passage, and you're trying to decide. Like you're trying to understand where does this fit in the in the in the whole scope of the big story of Scripture, and that that the whole big story has movement. It's it's progressive. Um, it it's it's done now. Well, a long time ago, it's canonized. It's complete. We we don't believe that God continues to speak inerrantly, infallibly through Scripture, uh, ongoing, continually, like adding to Scripture, like Revelation's the last book, right? That's what I mean. Um, but, but there was, it, it happened in time and, and it started in, from your perspective, it started in, in Genesis and, and it unfolded. It was, and, and it was what was once a seed of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, of a story blossomed into a tree over time and it had movement, it has movement, right? So that's, that's why there's a, there's an arrow there to say that this is, this is something that has movement and we'll get into the graph here in a second. Um, so it's a way to read the Bible. It's a way to read the Bible that where you see Jesus Christ as the center of it all, and you see what God is up to, what he's doing in all the different books of the Bible. Does that make sense? All right, just checking. Okay. So first question I, I had when I was coming to this was, what, is this biblical? <laughs> like going back to the terminology, what, what, where, where, do we come, where did this come from? Like, did this come from a bunch of really, really smart people up in some seminary class or whatever and said, aha, we're going to come up with... So there has been a formulation of this, like, the, like, the, like this, this is, is a thing, a discipline of how to read the Bible. But I wanted us to really be rooted in the scriptures, right? So, so we're going to see that this, actually, this is actually Jesus' idea, all right? So that's really important. Um, Doug, can you read um, John five thirty nine through forty? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Thank you. So, John five thirty nine through forty. He's uh, he's talking. Jesus is talking to the uh, the Pharisees, and um, and and what what were the scriptures back then? Old Testament, right, yeah, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So he's saying you search the Old Testament, and, and it's the Old Testament that bears witness about me, right? You, you have an issue with me, Pharisees. You don't like me, but you love the Old Testament. But the Old Testament's about me, <laughs> right, and, and how to have eternal life. And, and even, even the fact that, that um, it says that yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life, so you're going you're gonna to come to Jesus in the Old Testament. You're going to find Jesus in the Old Testament. And by finding him, there's eternal life. So the gospel is in the Old Testament. Jesus is the star of the Old Testament. 
And then this gets even more, you know, uh, just just clear uh, when Jesus, you know, f- unidentified to, the, to these to these two disciples who are who are sorrowful and they're walking on the road to Emmaus. Um, can I have someone uh, read? Nicole, do you want to read uh, Luke 24, verses 26 through 27? Thank you. We'll just pause there for a second before we move on to the next verse. Let's just look at that verse real fast, the two verses. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So he's walking along the side of these guys. The Christ is dead in their mind. Well, he is. They don't know he's going he's gonna to raise from the dead. They think the game is over. They're, they're sad. They're walking back. And he's, he's telling them, that th- this this was planned way before, and and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted, he interpreted, to them. So I would love to have heard this this sermon. You know, he's walking with them and he's saying, um, you know, l- let me show you where, where about the Christ in Numbers. Let me show you with about the Christ in Ezekiel. Let me show you about the Christ in in Micah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Deuteronomy. So that you can see it was necessary for these things to come about. What things? For, me, for Christ to be crucified, to suffer, and then, and then um, enter into glory. <clears throat> so, so he's making it really clear, right? Uh, Deanna, can you read verses 44 through 47? Thank you. Sorry about that. As I was trying to get the font bigger, I didn't think through the turn page. Yeah, yeah. It started off as a 10, and I thought, mm, not even for me anymore. I, I can't do that. <laughs> um, so, so again, I mean, w- w- one of the things, let, let's not re- be repetitive in one sense for the sake of time. So what, he just, what we just covered in verses 26 through 27, right, that the Psalms, the pro- now he has the Psalms in there, the Psalms, the prophets, um, the law of Moses, it's all about him. But here's, here's, the, here's, an, here's another thing that you drive from this, is that he says he, he opened their minds, to understand the scriptures. I mean, that, that's what we all want. That's what I want. That's, that's when we come to the word and we pray, you know, open the eyes of my heart that I may see wonderful things in your law, that I may know you, right, that I may cherish you. Um, but w- what's interesting here is that he opened their minds to understand the Old Testament, says the scriptures, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. And he, and he says the first word, he says thus, right? Meaning... Okay, when you look at the Psalms, when you look at the prophets and the law of Moses, thus, he's interpreting, what's he interpreting? That the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. I mean, he's deriving this from the law of Moses, the, the Psalms, from the prophets, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So that, that's, that's breathtaking, right? I mean, it, the, the, the air we breathe, I mean, just, I mean, I didn't grow up in church, but had kind of this vague idea of the Bible, Jesus, and you just think, okay, well, you know, the, the vague idea is, well, the God of the Old Testament is this thing that's just, just mean and, like, harsh and judgment and you know and then the and then jesus in the new testament kind merciful he you know i see the pictures and he's like you know he's got like the little glow and everything and the kids are running to him but you know it's it's like but but there there's not two different gods and jesus mercy is in the old testament right we we know that jesus is the point of the old testament jesus is the point when he comes on, on on earth he comes down and jesus is the point thereafter Right. So so what I wanted us to just walk away from point one. Right. 
is that biblical theology, this way of interpreting the Bible, of reading the Bible, seeing like, where is Jesus in the scriptures? This did not come from man. This came from God. This was God's idea, right? Um, and so I, that, that's, I just, I want you just to have that. And I was thinking about, well, what's, what are, what are the, you know, um, this makes sense, right? And, and not only does it, it's not just, okay, Jesus is really clear about this, but I was, thinking, I, I was born in 1980, and what's happening in 1980 in, in, in Hollywood, right, is, is Star Wars, right? So 77 is, is the, the first, which ended up being the fourth movie, A New, a New Hope, right? I remember, you know, I wasn't watching it when I was negative three, and then, and then 80, uh, 1980 Empire Strikes Back comes out, but somewhere around, like, when I was five, six, seven, when I could hold, like, um, a, a, a wrapping paper tube and pretend that, that, that those were our lightsabers back then that were only good for maybe one or two whacks, and then it was nunchucks, and then you throw them away. Um, <clears throat> my kids have, like, the ones that light up and shoot out and, you know, like, and, hurt, and actually hurt, are actually a weapon, and especially when you use it with the hand, hitting the handle, like, look, Dad, I can use the handle. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, bedspread, I remember sheets, I had sheets that were, were Luke Skywalker holding his lightsaber up and, you know, the poster and, and all of that stuff, right? And, um, you know, as a boy, maybe that this isn't just a boy thing, um, but just as a kid, I wanted to know when I was watching A New Hope, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys? So, so I'll, you know, I remember like my wife showing my kids like a, a classic, like a white Christmas a few years ago. And, um, and, and, and they're, the first question they're asking, they're, they're interrupting the movie. Who's the bad guy? Yeah. Where's the weapon? Who's the bad guy? Like, no, 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 but it's not that kind of a story. Well, you lost them, right? So in, in Star Wars, I'm like, who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? And um, okay, so Luke, Luke is this, 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 he's the good guy, right? And, and he's got this mentor who then he gets, you know, Obi-Wan gets killed, uh, spoiler alert, by, uh, by Darth Vader. Darth Vader's the bad guy. Okay, it's become really clear to me. Darth Vader's the bad guy, Luke's the good guy. And just in that movie alone, you're like, okay, got it figured out. I know the rules here and the movies to come are all about this good guy, bad guy. And then Empire Strikes Back comes out, and you're like, spoiler alert, Vader is his dad. And you're like, what? You know, no! Or whatever the, the infamous cry from Luke. Like, well, that, that changes things and how I understand this story a little bit. Um, I wonder why Luke is so messed up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, then, and then you see in, in Return of the Jedi now, Luke's no longer wearing white clothes he's in black but he's the good guy and then he believes there's hope for darth and this and that yada yada and you're like okay well then when episode one came out phantom menace um bear with me this is i, I know you're like okay we came here for biblical theology not Star Wars. when episode one came out and you got you know darth maul and all that stuff you're like okay now when i see that little boy talking about you know one day I'm gonna go. Vi I'm gonna visit all the planets up there. You're like, yeah, I know who that is. That's Anakin, and I know who Anakin is from 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 episodes four, five, six. I know, I know, I, I understand what that means. You know, if you didn't have uh, episodes four, five, six, and you just watched it straight up, you'd be like, oh, that's a cute little kid. You rub his head. Okay, little buddy, you're gonna go see all the planets. Good for you. But but you're like, no, this is Anakin. Like that, he's gonna be Darth, and yeah, he's gonna visit all the planets, but he's gonna slaughter a lot of people, and that's gonna be horrible. And so so, so you, my point in this, I'm not comparing Jesus to Anakin. Don't walk away from that, all right? I, my point is this, is that when you, when you, to see just a little bit of the picture, you only have, you only understand just a little bit, you know, episode four, like good guy, bad guy. When you get the whole picture, what's going on here, and I, now they're saying with episode nine, this is the Skywalker saga, right? So all throughout you have, you have the Skywalkers in it, and you say, okay, this is, this is where this is all going. This is, there's momentum, there's a point there. So that's, that's essentially, when you think about the, the, um, the Bible, you're like, okay, th this is all about Christ. This is all about Jesus Christ. He's, he doesn't turn into Darth Vader. Again, sorry if the, the illustration wasn't helpful. Um, so that, does that make sense? Okay. You need the whole story, right. And, and if you think that just one section is the story, it's like, no, you've got 66 books, and Jesus himself is saying they're all about me, right? 
So let me, let me explain this. I probably won't need much exp explanation, but just for point. So um, this was helpful for me. I, I don't know where I got this, but I'm pretty sure it's not original. Yes, Doug, probably, probably from the Bible, um, but I'm not sure. Did you just give a high five? <laughs> awesome. That's great. Great. Um, I love the encouragement, the mutual building up. So when you're thinking about um, the timeline, um, you know, you, you really have five timelines. You have, I mean, you can, you can go, I mean, we talk about time, you know, God's before time, right? So you can go even for, before creation. But you have creation, you have how God created, you have the garden, you know, and then you have, you have, you have, you have kind of following after that, the people of God, right? Israel. You have Jesus Christ coming down onto earth and, and the gospels, the four books. You have the epistles and, and what church life is, is, looks like now and deriving from what Christ has done. And then you have the, the end. You have the, the new, new creation. And this might go without saying, but I'm here to speak, so I'm going to say it. Um, <laughs> is that this, one, two, one and two, they're, they're all moving to here. But this doesn't move here. The church is looking back at Christ. And, and new creation is because of what Christ, who Christ is and what he's done. And so... From, from um, you know, well, again, well, I, it's hard to talk about this without saying, um, like, giving you the examples that we're going to get into. But, you know, so you have, in Genesis, you have the seed, right? The seed's going to come, and it's going to crush the head. And, and all throughout Old Testament, they're, looking, they're waiting for this seed. And, and then there's 400 years of silence, and then, bam, Christ comes. And then, and then and he, and he crushes the head of the serpent <laughs> on the cross, and then the, the church, you know, you see in Galatians chapter 3 that, that he's the seed that was predicted, that, was for, um, that we were looking for. And then that seed has now blossomed into this new, the, the myriads and myriads of people from every race, tongue, tribe, nation. They have Christ at the center. Christ is at the center of all of this. Okay, does that make sense? And so what, what might be a helpful way of, of reading your Bible is just just kind of having this one, two, three, four, five, and saying, now, wh where am I in the story? Is this a one, a two, a three, a four, a five? And, it, and wherever it is, where is Christ? Three will be pretty, like, in your face. It's the, the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <clears throat> um, so that's just a, that's just a, when, when we, we put that, that up on your first page, um, and when we start walking through, um, when I say we, Gre Greg Hodson um, is going to be teaching this as well. <clears throat> um, you'll get his, you'll get his, his wonderful British, British accent. Um, when, when, when we talk, when we're, when we're teaching these things, we're going to be helping you see, okay, so here's where this, this idea, this thread Starts. I just did it for seed, right? And here's where it plays out in the Old Testament with Israel. Here's where Christ is the fulfillment of that, and was you know, here's where what that looks like now in the new new in the church, the New Testament, and here's how it comes to fruition in the in new creation. One, two, three, four, five. Kind of a, a roadmap there, if that makes sense. Good. Okay. So that's that's why biblical theology, like the biblical support. Because Jesus says it, <laughs> all right. Because that's how how Jesus wants us to read it. Now let me get into um, the the need, and and um, we'll go a little faster here. Um, number one, the need uh, clarifies the Bible's main purpose. So let's read this. The Bible is not merely a collection of independent stories. A biblical theology helps clarify the purpose by looking at each passage in light of the whole Bible so we can understand how every part is related to Jesus. So I, I put down the example of Samson, right? So if we were preaching through the book of Judges, and, and you remember Samson, and he tears apart the lion with his bare hands, he, he, he kills a thousand Philistines with, with the, the jawbone of a, of a donkey. Um, 
he's the every Sunday school boy's favorite red-blooded biblical hero. He's, yeah, I want to be like him, right? Um, Will teaching about Samson killing a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone cause people to be born again? Just think about that. I mean, didn't Peter tell us that tell his readers, he, Peter wrote to his readers that, that they had been born again through the living and abiding word of God. And certainly Judges, the book of Judges, is a part of God's word. So what do you think? Like, will people be saved and be born again as you're preaching through Judges about the slaughter of a thousand Philistines? I think, I think the answer is it depends depends. If Samson had, had, had been preached properly, and that's the, how, what, what, who are you, Keith, to, to decide what's proper? No, no, Jesus is saying it's about me, right? So if, if preached properly, the way that Jesus designed it to be preached and thought of and un- interpreted and understood, I think the answer is yes. You might talk about Samson as a type of Christ. You, you might say that he, he was a God-anointed judge endued with you know, remarkable power through the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's handed over to the enemies of God's people for the purpose of rescuing God's people. You might ask what Samson's story teaches us about God, right? You can say that he's a, his patience with his people and his determination to judge sin. What, what does Samson's story teach us about our need for a savior? For one who will not disappoint us like every judge or king who has ever lived except one? Samson's strength is striking. He kills a thousand Philistines, but, but how much more striking is the picture of Christ destroying the work of the devil on the cross, raising from the dead in triumphant victory over sin, and his second coming on the last day? with a sword coming out of his mouth to strike down the nations and treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God? Only, only Jesus is the judge who is perfect and righteous and good. Right? When we think about even like, when we think about, I'm going to, it's kind of ad hoc here. When we think about like this map, right, this road map, and you think about, about Jesus and his power, right? Well, he's on the, so, so Samson here, number two, Old Testament, Christ comes and, and he dies and then he not just died, but he's raised from the dead. That took power, right? That's power. Power for Samson. Power there. And then what does Ephesians uh, 1 tell us at the end? That that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. Right? And then eventually that same resurrected power recreates the um, creation, recreates the church. So the resurrection, power, we all will be raised again with new bodies. So you just see this thread, right? A lot of people unknowingly get myself in trouble here. Not, not theologically, but I might be skipping ahead a little bit. A lot of people would say this. Here's this, this idea. Don't think about the timeline. Think about like, an, like a thread, piece of fabric. A lot of people might say, like, okay, Old Testament, yeah, but then the New Testament is God's second plan. It's kind of his, his plan B. And, and then, but then God hasn't forgotten his first plan, and then, and then at the end, there's a plan for the Jews. The thread kind of breaks with the coming of Christ and the church. It's, it's yeah, that's, that's plan B, Right? What we're saying is, no, it's, it's one glorious, redemptive, magnificent plan that starts and ends in Jesus Christ. One thread, Samson's power shows off who Christ's power, which is the power that we're given, which then causes power to be born again and, and raised from the dead and at the end of the day. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so... Yes, the preaching of Samson potentially could save, save many, right? Can bring many to Christ if preached with Christ as the, the key. Number two, biblical theology, it, it will guard and guide the church. 
It, reading scripture rightly means knowing where each book fits in its overarching uh, narrative. And we've, we've talked about that a little bit. But this helps us read and understand accurately each event, character, lesson that's been given to us a part, uh, as part of God's progressively revealed word, right? So I talk, I, th- this is the idea I said earlier, seed to tree, it's progressive, it's unfolding, it's growing. We want to know the context. We want to know, hey, um, <laughs> we're getting into this uh, next week, big time. What, what covenant is this under? I mean, what, what, are we re- what covenant are we even reading about? Are we under that same covenant? How do we, how do we think through application? This is unfolding. This, these kinds of questions will help protect the church from from air um, it'll help guide the church right um, I, I put down here example is the letter to the Hebrews um, because the new new in, New Testament interprets the Old Testament that's another little thing here is that as the seed is becoming bigger and bigger as you're getting more and more of the picture the big picture that oh um, Darth Vader isn't just the bad guy he's 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 this and you're seeing the bigger picture you say okay um, then what happens at the end sh- is bringing light into what was what was once a seed like I, I can see now the apples hanging off the tree now I understand that that seed that was put in there was an apple seed it was apple tree right um, so he so Hebrews I mean all the all the New Testament books do this, but Hebrews, right, is huge. It's like, okay, uh, you thought when you're reading the Old Testament and and the seed was growing that it was about this sacrificial system and and priests and whatnot. No, it's it's obsolete now. It's all about Jesus Christ. It was all about the better one, the better priest, the better mediator. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Sorry, guys, I know it's hot. You guys are doing a great job. Yeah. <laughs> you strategically sat right next to it. <laughs> no one's giving you high fives for that one. <laughs> um, all right, number three. Helps us in our evangelistic outreach. Um, instead of compartmentalizing the gospel, biblical theology helps people understand the big picture, Christian worldview with Christ at the center. Um, if I were to say the word worldview... I, I wonder how many different, you know, the bubble is popping up right now in everyone's mind. I wonder what everyone's thinking, how, how different it is. But worldview, just, I'm going to kind of give a broad, right, it's just how you see the world, right, how you interpret the world, the, the grid in which you're interpreting, you're understanding the world that you live in, right? Many different worldviews out there. But here's the, here's the thing, even what, what biblical theology is, is even within Christianity, even within a Christian worldview, there's subset worldviews, right? As I had just pointed out, some would say part, you know, Old Testament's part A, plan A, and the church is plan B. That, that's, that's, that's one subset worldview of Christianity. So biblical theology is another world, is another subset of the, of the Christian worldview. It's a system of thought, a system of how to interpret the scriptures. And, uh, you know, it does, can anyone get, um, pull up Romans 2, you, you have it, 28 to 20. can you read that out loud? Yeah. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outwardly and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Thank you. So, um, one, one translation, a true Jew is one who's circumcised inwardly in the heart, right? So I remember uh, working at Wells Fargo years ago and talking to a co-worker, and I was meditating on, on Romans 2. I was just in Romans 2. Romans 2 was in me. And uh, we were talking and I, at a break, and he said, uh, yeah, I'm Jewish. And, I'm just, and I said, oh, really? Me too. <laughs> and he said, Really? I don't know what I'm giving, what kind of vibe I'm giving off that I couldn't pass as being Jewish. It's all good. I said, yeah, because Romans 2 says that a true Jew is one who's circumcised inwardly in the heart, right? And he got saved. Yeah, which was like, you got, that was, I think, a Holy Spirit moment. It wasn't like, I'm not like flaunting his, his cherished Jewish uh, traditions that, yeah, so am I. And he's like, no, you're not, blah, blah, blah. And we fight. No, it was like, no, it, it, what happened was I read that passage to him. He goes, 
I've always wondered how the Old Testament fit with the New. He was struggling with the big picture, the, the movement, the big story. What's up with all these priests? And what's the deal? Like, what's the deal with circumcision? Like, wh- like he was struggling with these big questions. And, 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 you, and you get to show people evangelistically, like, yeah, this isn't just um, a new, Christianity isn't just like a new thing, uh, my brother who's a Jew. Like, it's a continuation. It's a fulfillment of what was already said a long time ago, right? And when you unfold the scriptures, and that guy got saved. It was, it was, it was a, a, I mean, you're just, you're just watching it and you're like, this is the work of God. This is amazing. This is awesome. So evangelistic, it helps. Um, uh, number four, it helps us read, understand, and teach the Bible the way Jesus said we should. Now, now we already covered this pretty clearly, but it's just some explicit Examples. If you want to get your Bible and you want to be one who reads for us, 1 Corinthians 10. I, I chose this one because we're in 1 Corinthians, so this is kind of, I'm not going to draw these ones out. These are little teasers for you guys to say, okay, hmm, I wonder, I'm going to start thinking through that and reading about it when we get there. But this, uh, Jamie, do you want to read 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 1 through 4? Oh, my bad. <laughs> oh, someone else has it? Okay, Latanya. Sorry, Jamie. All right, so that's explicit that, hey, it, hey, Corinthians, uh, I'm gonna, Paul's like, I'm going to bring up Moses. Um, why? Because that rock was Christ. What? <laughs> what, is that, you know, what are you talking about? So that's, that's explicit. Like, okay, there's, there's Christ is the rock, and he's, there's, there's going to be a, a movement of, of that. That's a thread. That's a thread. There are hundreds, probably thousands of threads that are each individually have a unique color and are just woven through from creation all the way through the new creation with Christ being the color of that thread. And they're just woven through the story of God's redemptive plan. And so you see that explicitly there. And so we'll, we'll get to it's a teaser. That's a, well, I don't know when we'll get to chapter 10, but we're going to get there. Um, who, and I apologize, Jamie. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, anyone who wants to read Jamie. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, okay, Luke chapter 11, verse 32. Who wants to read it? Go ahead, Nicole. Thank you. So Jonah, Jonah, wonderful story, Sunday school story, the big whale. It's not a whale, it's a fish. Blah, blah, okay. and, and, um, but Jonah is really about the anticipation of Jesus, right? One stays in the belly for three days, three nights. One, one okay, you get in trouble here. Jesus didn't, let me just, disclaimer, Jesus didn't actually go into hell, okay? But he's, he was dead for three days. He's in the belly of the, the ground and the, he's dead. Right, and then he's raised. He's he comes out, and it's, it's for the, it's to proclaim a, 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 the the good news that God's gonna 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 restrain judgment if you trust in this 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 Savior. So 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 Jesus Himself is saying, "Hey, uh, Jonah, I'm not gonna preach. I'm not gonna take this time to preach about Jonah. I'm gonna take this time to preach Christ, preach myself in Jonah. Is what He's doing. He's saying something greater than Jonah's here." You know, he can unfold that, just like he's greater in the book of Hebrews, just like he's greater in every way, in everything, right? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Okay. Now, we'll get into this as we get into the chapter, uh, week three, week four with tools. It's because you want to responsibly be able to interpret these things. You don't want to just say, everything is Jesus without really, you know, um, you don't want to allegorize, right? We're not talking about allegory here. But we're just saying, but no, there, you can see where this all becomes, where, where it's anticipated, where Christ comes to fulfill it, where it's in the church, and then it's, it's consummated in the new creation. You see this thread, right? Okay. Last, uh, well, not last. Number five, it protects biblical counseling. I mean, this, this is huge. 
I'm not going to give the examples on that one, but it's huge because when you use scripture, and we're all counselors, right? We're all, the scriptures say, counsel one another, right? Um, give counsel one another. So we're always, we're all theologians in here. We're always going to be speaking something theological about Jesus, about God, whether it's accurate or inaccurate. We're all theologians. We're all counselors. And so when you're giving scripture to people and you're, you're trying your best to use like a, like a surgeon, you're using that scalpel to, to, to heal and, and, and help. If, if, if not done properly, that scalpel will, will wreak havoc, right? Um, it can really cause damage and, in fact, kill. Um, and so this is a way to, it protects biblical counseling so that the person leaving there doesn't walk away from your counsel with some moralism, some, some, some therapeutic deism, like, okay, I'll just believe in a God and who, who I have to first act and then he'll do it. Then he'll, you know, I pick myself up by my bootstraps and then he'll do this. Or, like, so this helps us. This protects our counseling with one another. Number six, I'm going to lump six, seven, and eight together because they're, as Greg and I talked with the pastors, this is the heart. This is the heart element of it is that, guys, we really, biblical theology at the heart of it, we just want to fall more in love with God, right? We're, this isn't just about head knowledge. This is about, I want to behold wonderful, marvelous things in your word. I want to be astonished again, yet again, at the person and work of Jesus Christ. I, I want to be able to look at the Bible and just be blown away of God's intentionality to have it done this way, you know, um, progressively. Um, the Quran believe, you know, um, Islam teaches that the, the Quran, the Quran was, was just given all in one, boom, to Muhammad. Right? The, the, this is, it didn't happen this way in the Bible. It was a seed, and over time it progressed, right? And, and, and we want to understand it responsibly and know it so we can treasure Jesus Christ all the more. So this is a heart thing. So I, I would encourage you guys, do what, do, join me with, you know, we pray before class, but even pray before you come here, just pray that the Holy Spirit would just be growing your heart to love. I mean, he already is. You guys are here. You're wanting to do this. So that's, that's fruit that God's at work in you already. Um, but let's just continue to want more and more of who God is. Be hungry for him. Okay. And we're going to end here. Um, let me end by, <clears throat> I'm going to give just a couple quick examples, and then we'll have some Q&A. We have time. It's about, eh, it's, where are we at here? It's 942. So we've got eight minutes. So I can give these examples in about three minutes, and then we'll go from there, five minutes of Q&A or whatever. <laughs> it doesn't leave a lot of Q&A, but... So examples of false gospels that biblical theology helps us to avoid. I said earlier that it protects the church, right? Number one, the prosperity gospel church. So <clears throat> I literally had this happen to me this week, okay? Person comes to me, Christian, I don't know claims to be a Christian, um, says, you know, all you got to do is just, <laughs> you want good things in your life, like, you, you got to think it. You got to think it. You got to have the right mental paradigm. It has to start with you. And then they proceeded to open the scriptures up to, to prove this, right? And um, the, their, their church um, mission statement, the, the, the verse is 3 John 2, which is just, you know, like, that's a, that's a, that's a, you don't know, find that one often in, in, in churches, right? Third John 2. But um, <laughs> we're going to ground and find everything off of Third John 2. Okay, excellent. Um, and Genesis 12, he starts to talk to me about Genesis 12. Really? Tell me about Genesis 12. Well, you know, Abraham, things were bad for him in the land of Ur with the Chaldeans. And God had so much good things to do in his life and great things to give him. But he needed Abraham to do some things first. Really, like what? Well, he needed to, to, to leave. He needed to make some changes. He needed to change locationally. So he needed to leave there. Associate with other people who are successful, like the king, like, like Abimelech. He, he needed him to, to just have a different mindset, a mental paradigm about, about what God is and who he is. And then God, it, it's all, he said this for me verbatim. Your success is God, no, he said this. He said, God, 
blessing you is predicated on your change. You change, God blesses. Now, this isn't about bashing other people. This is just to say, understanding the scriptures in biblical theology helps protect us from that. So you see, oh yeah, but um, Genesis 15, when the covenant is enacted with, with Abraham, guess what Abraham's doing? Guess what part Abraham's doing? He's sleeping. And you think God did that on purpose? I think so, because then the, the, the sacrifice is cut in half, it's bloody, and Abraham's over here, and God is walking down the middle. He is essentially signing, if you have a mortgage, or he's signing both sides, the lender and the, the, the payee, or the, well, the right terminology. He's signing both sides of the covenant. God is enacting it, he's keeping it, he's doing it. And Abraham's contribution is to sleep. All right, that's the gospel. That's understanding the biblical theology. That's understanding how that works out in Christ. It helps us to protect us from the civil gospel of the church, that, that, you know, um, uh, that America is a Christian nation, and, and we need to get back to just um, affecting the laws for Christ so that, so that America will be Christian. Well, America was never a Christian nation because we are exiles. We're sojourners Christians, right? Our home isn't here. Our, we're, he, we're waiting for a home whose builder is God, right? Our, he, our home is in heaven with God. And so it's not wrong to be engaged in government, but that's not the gospel. Like, that's not why Jesus came. He came to save people and bring them to know him so that they, too, will, be, will join us in our sojourning and, uh, and come with us to, the, to their home in heaven. The soup kitchen church, you know, the church is all about just serving, getting in the community. Again, nothing's wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That's actually good, right? But that's not why essentially Jesus came. That's not essentially why the Bible was written. That's not essentially the main message of the Bible. It's just do good to others. Do good to others because God has done so much for you in Christ, right? So love God and then love your neighbor. But that's, that's not the main point. The immorality, immorality affirming church, just, you know, um, uh, sin all you want, <laughs> kind of like Genesis 6, uh, you know, sin all the more so that grace may abound. Um, homosexuality isn't wrong, you know, gay marriage isn't wrong. Um, just be you, you know, you're born this way, so just be you and you're accepted. What, is that, is that the essential message of the Bible? It's not the essential message of the Bible, and Jesus Christ he came to rescue us from who we are naturally, to redeem us, to renew us. We see that from a big picture standpoint. Okay, guys, before we take some Q&A here, next week we're going to do two things. We're going to get into the idea of how does, what's the relationship between the Old Testament and New Testament, and what's the relationship between biblical theology and systematic theology? Because you probably have heard systematic theology before. Well, how, how do those two disciplines cooperate with one another how they play with each other are they meant to play with each other yes they are so we'll just get into that next time so before we close in prayer any questions any comments any any vegetables you want to throw at me any uh so i can dodge you guys are all good what's that It, it is it is it's a lot we're slowing, yeah, slow it down. We're just going to, this, this, honestly, guys, this was probably the most dense of all the classes. Is, uh, yes, sir. Do you have any texts you're drawing from for this class outside of the Bible? Do I have any text? Yeah, like specific theology. Yes, yes, I do. Um, what I was thinking about, Greg and I, is, um, we can either, we're definitely going to put resources on that path, right? But we're thinking, I was going to bring him in. The, I'll, I'll bring him in the class next week. I have lots of books. Lots of the, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll range them from, here's the really helpful, condensed, you know, short little book. Here's the medium one. And then here's the advanced guy. Um, we'll bring those in for sure. That's a great question. Any other questions? So is it actually going to be like pathright.com or is it going to be a longer address and so, it, yeah, it, we're gonna, you're going to get it because uh, either Jamie um, or Greg will email you guys. Because when you registered, you put your email address on there. The yeah, I don't think you registered, but... Yeah, same thing. Oh, okay, yeah. 
And same thing for the members, the, the new members class. I don't know if, you, but, but yeah, so we'll, we'll get that link to you guys in your email. And I know that even though I know you're here, so we'll make sure you get that, so. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Did everyone back then know of the salvation that was to come? Yeah, yeah, great question, great question. Answer, answer real, the real, the brief, brief answer is, is, is Romans 4, right, that, that Abraham was saved by faith. There was an element of faith. However, it might not have been the full, comprehensive, again, seed to tree idea that he knew exactly, but he knew that there was a Savior coming. He, he knew something outside of himself that he had faith in. So Romans 4 his faith was credited him as righteousness. So it's not to the one who works, but to the one who has faith, who believes. That's the one who is saved. And that's Paul's whole argument, Romans 4. If that's not true, then, he, then, then the argument falls apart. So. You just don't know. We just don't know who had faith, who had future, you know. Right. Israel, who had faith in the future Christ that was coming. Right. Many of the Israelites, yeah. but there were. Uh, and a, 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 Romans 11, not all of Israel was Israel, and, and, and some, were, were, some of the branches were, were chopped off, and some were grafted in. Uh, Rahab wasn't a Jew. She's grafted in, Ruth. So I still, to this day, don't know who the real church, the real, like, who are Christians. Like, I don't, like, I don't know, like, like, for sure. I just know what they say. I know the fruit. You'll know the, the, you'll know the tree by the fruit. But, you know, so... Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, right? All these guys by faith, but not just, not just Abraham. Anyone else? Great question, Tommy. So we'll get into that for sure. So we'll, we're going to get into some fun examples. We'll get into cl- the last one will be clothing, the theology of clothing, like biblical theology of clothing, how Christ is the center of that. So we're going to have fun with this, guys, but I really appreciate your time. Let me pray for us, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that you are at work in all of us. Thank you for your word that is trustworthy as a rock, is solid. Thank you that, that, that Jesus not only saved us, lived and died for us and was raised for us, but then even taught us how to read the Bible. <laughs> you are so patient, so gracious, so loving. And we, we pray that this class in the weeks to come will just produce a love for you that's greater than what we had uh, before coming in here, that you'll just continue to grow our hunger for your word and astonishment and amazement at Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.